Okay, I think we are live here. So we'll give um, some people a chance to get logged on. And okay, hello everyone. Um, and welcome to our live stream. This is Meryl with Akron Soul Train. And tonight I am joined by Akron Soul Train artist in residence, Drew Bolidi. <laughs> um, and we are going to be touring his show, Here, There, Everywhere, that is currently up at the Akron Soul Train Gallery, um, Burton D. Morgan Foundation Exhibition Space in downtown Akron. The show is up through December 3rd, and gallery hours are Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 4 p.m. We will be closed this Thursday for Thanksgiving. Um, Akron Soul Train is an artist residency program connecting and empowering the community and artists by granting fellowships that provide resources for all creative disciplines to foster a more vibrant Akron. We'd like to thank our sponsors for their continued support the GAR Foundation, Akron Community Foundation, the Ohio Arts Council, the Leonard Family Foundation, the Brennan Family Foundation, the Knight Foundation, the Char and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, and the Corbin Foundation. And a very special thank you to Brennan, Mana, and Diamond for sponsoring Drew's residency. Um, and anyone viewing, please ask any questions um, in the comments and we will get to them maybe during, maybe towards the end, um, since I will be having my phone with me. Um, and please comment on any of our other videos that you watch on our Facebook or YouTube channels or Instagram. I think there might be a few on there. Um, how you like this type of virtual programming. Okay, so I'm going to switch my camera around so that we can see Drew and see the beautiful artwork. There we go. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us. I guess we're gonna start uh, here at the beginning and we're gonna tour you around the exhibition piece by piece. Uh, like Meryl said, if you have questions, just pop them in the comments and we'll do our best to uh, get responses to them as we go along. Um, we're standing here by the front door and we're just going to walk you on through. Um, we're going to stop uh, and give you a view of first the collage work and then we'll give you a view of the three-dimensional work and then we'll try to take a step back and uh, you can kind of see it in tandem. The goal of this, ex you know, this residency and I guess the exhibition is to kind of question how a singular artist uh, can interact with a community while simultaneously creating some artwork that hopefully energizes that community and shows that community's story. Um, for my residency, I hosted a number of what we called story collection sessions where people could come into the gallery and either respond to a story prompt or uh, just tell a story that they had on their mind about something that was going on in Akron or something that had happened in Akron. And I took all of that information and documented it and took notes. And then I went into the studio and started hunting around for found imagery that could represent either the whole story. Uh, in most cases, it was really just parts of the story. Uh, and we were able to kind of create a dialogue back and forth between the community and my artistic practice. And again, create some kind of output that was both representational but also hopefully enjoyable and fun and, you know, brought in some whimsy uh, to that whole process of people having a conversation. Uh, so we're here uh, looking at the first piece, and I think Meryl will shine it up on the, the screen right now. Uh, this is all done through uh, found image collage. Uh, it's on a piece of board, and uh, I just went through hunting uh, for images that were... Um, I guess really sort of uh, electric and, and had like a, a nice energetic vibe to them. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting the fact that you kind of used these found imagery because uh, as we go through, you guys might be able to pick out motifs, images that kind of happen multiple times and I will be asking about those. <laughs> Okay. So 
So it's really interesting because the collages are something that are, are able to happen rapidly, um, but the ceramics themselves are something that are, are more methodical and obviously because of the different nature between paper and clay, they happen at a different pace. So uh, I think of the collages in some ways as sketches. They do represent these stories in, in many cases uh, that were collected, but they also uh, you know, are a picture plane where I can begin to work out questions in two dimensions before uh, switching into working in three dimensions. Uh, you know, the, the world of ceramics is extremely diverse and I do not uh, find my practice living in that sort of representational space where uh, if you sculpt a cat, it looks like a cat. If you sculpt a donkey, it looks like a donkey. Uh, the things I do, I think, are more liminal, and they try to deal with uh, colors and sort of vague shapes that this thing looks like something. So the, the collages get to be a place where things look like real things, and then that uh, translation kind of evolves down in the sculptural work where the colors are carrying the emotion, the visual weight, and all of the kind of uh, pressure that wants to be involved in the piece. Yeah, and this is your first time exhibiting them together, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, they, they lived separately, um, but hopefully they're, they're kind of more powerful uh, as a grouping than they are on their own. Yeah, it's really interesting. And as we go forward, kind of playing these very abstract forms off of the representational. Yes. really important to yeah. kind of have that push-pull between the two. Okay. Okay, we can move on down this wall. The really interesting part about working with things that are so representationally specific is they give an overall kind of uh, recognizability and quality that does make them really relatable for everybody. So like Superman appears in this one and you've got Gonzo from the Muppets and, and those create one level of, of kind of identifiability and interest whereas this robot and this, uh, this other floaty head are more vague, like they're not a specific reference, but they still kind of exist in that same family uh, structurally and, and psychosomatically, I guess. They, they create more of a semaphore of uh, just design than they do anything ultra specific, but paired with these recognizable references, they, they really kind of create a world or a context that the whole piece can exist in. Yeah, and the same kind of works for the kind of pattern pieces and the block, the color block yeah. style pieces. It was really interesting as I was working, all of the colors kind of come together and I realized that you did want some blank space. So even the whites were then, uh, you know, pasted back in these big white spot yeah. medallions are, you know, almost topically on top of things but they create a nice blank where your eye can just sort of rest instead of being completely overwhelmed. And that's also something that I do in the ceramic work. A lot of uh, this work is formed and then it's you know creating a three-dimensional canvas uh, to begin working color back onto and into. Uh, ceramic surfaces are really special in that they absorb and pull color into them. So. I'm constantly creating these sort of three-dimensional uh, paintings that I want to then go and blank back out, which is where all the layers of white glaze come in. It's almost like cake frosting in that way, that you have like really dense areas and then sort of areas where your eyes can pause and rest. Yeah, that's really interesting because the white, there's still like texture to it, so it's not completely negative space. Yeah. This, uh, it's like this the is history a, of it. <laughs> this is a glaze that uh, is actually really low in glass. Uh, you know, we're used to ceramics being shiny and reflective. That's a high amount of silica, which is the basic forming uh, element of glass. But this glaze is very low in it. So you get these uh, 
areas that have a nice matte texture and they really sort of copy and hold uh, the way they're put on, whether with a brush or a lot of times I'm just glomming this on by hand. <laughs> Wow. Uh, and that holds, which is kind of fun. I use a series of squeeze bottles as well to kind of like uh, spread the glaze on there. Uh, and you get that kind of drip and that like thickness. Okay. Come over here. This was one of the first uh, collages that, that sort of began to lay out uh, this tiling background, which Meryl mentioned motifs and this sort of, I'm going to call it a checkerboard for simplicity. This checkerboard background uh, began existing here, but I was looking at the language of quilting and the way that you uh, would connect different color squares. And instead of doing that checkerboard chessboard, there's like a four pattern repeat here where you have uh, a, a tiled on square and then you have background color and you have neutral and then you go back to that tiled on square. So hopefully what that does is in this two dimensional plane, uh, this picture plane, it creates multiple layers of space that can be really read as a world, like a diorama for your eye to exist in. Yeah, that actually makes a good point because a lot of collage work can read very flat. Super flat, sure. Yeah. And this definitely, you can see the different layers, the use of some perspective, the diagonals. The really fun part is I've been photographing them and I, I've sort of beginning to notice even in the photograph, you can pick up those little shadows. And it's strange to think of paper having enough uh, depth to leave a shadow, mm -hmm. but of course, digital uh, image quality is getting so good now, you can start to see it and I feel uh, that that's something that I really enjoy because it gives a, a visual tactility to something that is often, like Meryl said, very flat. And I think that's one of the reasons as we get down the line, you can see that interplay between the three-dimensional object and the, the two-dimensional or 2.5-dimensional <laughs> object that allows for, for your eye to really have enjoyment with it. I'm going to come over here. This one is so fun. <laughs> the ceramic <laughs> objects are, are interesting in the sense, and I, I hate this word and I hate coming back to this, but these came up during the pandemic. And there was a notion of how do you reference that time and all of these like varied emotions you were feeling of, of sort of anxiety and uh, you know questioning of what happens next, but also still very much trying to live in the moment and really trying to enjoy every day. I guess it's more important to try to do that when you're not sure what's happening the next day or the next day or the next day. It's, to try and be in there. And for me, you know, one of the ways that I got through all of that was, was having a studio to retreat to. And I feel very lucky for that because, you know, I have friends in New York and Chicago who were just not leaving the house, but I would get out and I would be able to go work in the studio and kind of work through all of the feelings. So it's funny when people really enjoy these pieces because <laughs> they were made during a, a moment of really kind of questioning, well, what what's next? Yeah, no, and it's interesting to see such abstract pieces kind of talked about in that more emotional process mm -hmm. type way. Yeah. I think that's the thing is we, we over time have sort of uh, begun to think that only representational images get to be um, in the discussion of, of feelings and uh, you know, what we're processing. But I, I think, you know, the, the abstract, the sort of, uh, in between is, is just as able to do that. For me, it's done through this layering of color because I think we all think in bright and funky and, uh, you know, you have to wrap even a bad situation up in a nice paper. <laughs> That's an interesting way. I don't, I see this, this piece in particular just has very much that red, white, and blue yeah. kind of theme yeah. going oh, yeah. on. So that's interesting in consideration of the time period that you made it. I think that's kind of important for this uh, this ring to really take on that periwinkle because it's all of those colors and also yeah. none of them, which is that, that push. Oh, oh, I love that. Okay. 
So now these two collages are kind of a pairing. Yeah, there, there are two collages in the exhibition um, that were actually sort of the last ones that I was making as I was getting more confident um, in working two-dimensionally or 2.5-dimensionally as we're calling it. It became important to let the imagery spread across a couple uh, larger panels. So first two and then three, and, and we'll see that piece later on. But these feel like the most layered and were actually the ones that took so long and there was so much laying down an image and then picking it back up because it didn't feel uh, necessarily correct. But, you know, that, that's the fun part of the process for the artist is uh, trying to get it correct and then being able to go back. And that's so different from ceramics, which is, again, for me, is another reason to work on both of these things. The ceramics, you sort of get one shot. Um, you know, you're putting it in the kiln and you're, you're making sure that that firing locks the color on, but you're also kind of hoping and feeling stressed out that you know if it doesn't, it's a whole other process to get it to a place where you're comfortable with. Um, in a few hours, you can lay down a lot of images and pull them back up and lay them back down and feel like there's some resolution. Was it freeing working in this kind of like more fast paced it was super, way? It was super freeing in, in, a, in a funny way where now I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you can build that freedom into the ceramic work as well, which is, you know, funny because again, in the spectrum of ceramics, this is uh, the work I make is not considered super tight as compared to, again, like someone who is doing representational things. I think my process is already loose, but the, the two-dimensionality allows a speed and a freedom where the challenge is to collect a, a great group of source materials to draw from um, and then make something, uh, whereas in the ceramics, it's all definitely uh, from in the head and in the hand. So it's, it's a different kind of world, but they play with each other so nicely. Yeah, definitely. Okay, moving on. And just talking about, um, you know, where the imagery comes from. For me, uh, prior to my residency, the month prior to my residency at, at Akron Soul Train, I uh, went hunting around uh, to a number of Goodwill shops, to a number of old um, shops that carry various items like uh, paper materials and magazines and I slowly started collecting the ones that looked cool and that that too was kind of a thought process there was uh, some kind of conscious thought to figure out what type of uh, material would be good um, and it was kind of interesting for me as an artist to see the things that I immediately thought would be awesome like I went seeking National Geographic and Life magazines. They actually, in a lot of cases, didn't work out to be what I wanted because the colors were not as vibrant or especially in older magazines, I, I'd never really thought of this, uh, but when you go back to say like the 80s or before, the paper quality of a magazine is almost like tissue where right now, uh, you know, I wound up hunting a lot of uh, comic books and children's books because they had that sort of vibrance that I wanted in the color. So it was nice to kind of traipse around and see uh, the community even as a collector to begin to think of places where you can pull uh, older artifacts that you want to uh, bring into like a contemporary dialogue. Yeah, that's really interesting and in saying like you're collecting these stories from the community but collecting the, the magazines or the media that the community has consumed over the years Absolutely. is also another yeah. way. And, and going to places where people would have uh, consumed and, and sort of <clears throat> recycled and then trying to upcycle all of it, finding that material is as important in some way as finding the stories, because without the material, there's not much in my process that would really help tell a story. So it was nice to kind of uh, be, I call it an editor artist, you know, I, I had to kind of pick the pieces that would reconstitute uh, the story we were telling. Yeah. And again, the, the part of that that's so interesting for me is that's different from what I do when I'm engaging the ceramic practice of my studio. That's more like we were talking about playing with color, playing with emotion, playing with uh, 
you know, feelings as they are represented through objects rather than uh, playing with feelings as they are represented through recognizable images. And, and hopefully there is that push-pull. I know we've, we've used that term a lot. Um, but that's that kind of feeling with, that you want where you're never really inside of it, but you're never really outside of it. Do you have any, um, now that we've seen a few of the ceramic pieces, um, kind of about the rings themselves? I, um, I think the fun part about the rings, and, and this gets into the sort of uh, nerdiness that is inherent in <laughs> ceramics because it's both uh, you know, craft-based and technological. Uh, they're <coughs> the only part of any of this that's made on a potter's wheel. And I feel like when you uh -huh. say the word ceramics, um, just because of recognizability and because of the movie Ghost, uh, <laughs> people always immediately think of the potter's wheel, you know, the whole Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore thing. And these are made on there, but they're made to just be an object that can be racked onto uh, something sculptural. The original idea for all of these rings came from the classic children's toy uh, where you have those plastic rings that you stack yeah. onto some kind of spire and it tends to go up and down the rainbow like red, orange, because you know it's children learning about color and learning about the tactility of, of things. Uh, so the inspiration comes from that, but I view them as like sort of visible weights. Um, many of the pieces are entitled yoke. Uh, which is what you would sort of like put on a an oxen or on a cow when you uh, use it as a uh, an animal's labor or a beast of burden. So I look at them again, uh, talking about all of those feelings that were being uh, explored during that pandemic, that sort of unsure moments. Uh, so when I stack them on things, I think of it as like another kind of weight around everyone's neck, feeling that compression of those, those mm -hmm. moments. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But then they're really bright colored, so they have to be remotely enjoyable. <laughs> okay, shall we continue yeah. down this line? Yeah, I do like the you're talking about children's toys. You see elements of kind of coloring books or something like that. And it's just adds this really interesting texture next to the magazine pages. Yeah. I mean, the one goal was to not fill uh, any of the picture planes with super uh, recognizable people um, or, you know, the people had to be uh, a little more uh, analogous to being neutral than being recognizable. So there's only three people who uh, appear on any of the collages. Uh, we passed James Baldwin just recently, um, really important uh, writer. Uh, John Waters came up and Lucille Ball came up. So these are all sort of people, I wouldn't say um, that are, are important to the piece that they're in, but provide a certain a weight in terms of, I guess, being the opposite of a celebrity culture, but creating a context yeah. that we can, again, engage in where we notice that person, but we don't make the whole work about them. Yeah, and it's almost like the with Superman, they're almost more like icons. Absolutely. They can They represent something yes. more than just themselves. Very much so, very yeah. much so. And that's like Gonzo that, that appeared in the, the earlier one and the Quaker oatmeal. Those are all things that we, I, I, again, because of where these things are placed, you know them immediately and mm -hmm. they, they are a symbol. They're an icon. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Come over here. This piece still makes me laugh because I'm still uh, kind of unsure of it. The green still reads very cactus to me, but uh, I've received so much feedback on this piece from people where they they really uh, enjoy that it's in the back of the gallery and they feel almost magnetically yeah. pulled to it from that like super bright canary yellow on top that it just kind of has a force that both drags your eye and kind of yourself to it, uh, which I think is really fun. I think of some of these uh, as non-functional vessels. So they're related to the history of ceramics. They have an opening, but you're not really going to use them. You're going to appreciate them for their 
sort of inability to be functional, which again, I think is very representative of, of a few moments yeah. we've all been through it lately. And when you place these objects, uh, a lot of times with sculpture, it's meant to be kind of walked all the way around, but you do see one side more prominently. Did you, how did you take that into kind of consideration? Um, I think, you know, there's sort of a, a intimate relationship between uh, them and me as I'm making them. And I often find as I'm forming things and uh, adding the layers of color to them, I think like, oh, that's the side that is, for lack of a better word, the front. <laughs> and, and oftentimes that's the part that winds up facing out as I'm like, oh, I somehow uh, consciously or subconsciously connected to the front of that piece and I want to showcase it to people. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting because you really do get so much from taking the time to walk around and see the kind of crevices that are kind of almost hidden. I think a lot of people would maybe put those crevices in the front, sure. for lack of a better yeah. term. I think the whole thing wants to really be, well, people always want to touch sculpture, and I'm a, I'm a big proponent <laughs> of that. But, of course, in the gallery setting, we really want to kind of crawl over them with our eye. And I feel like the goal in creating these layers uh, in the two-dimensional work, but the three-dimensional work as well, are to provide those sort of nooks and crannies that the eye can go in and go around and, and really kind of feel like it's taking stock of. Okay, interesting. Okay, we're gonna come back up this wall now. And you uh, mentioned before when we were talking, this is kind of one of your first times working very bright colors. Yeah. How has that been? Um, very freeing in a way. I, there, there's so much that happens as an artist where uh, your process is so much tied to yourself and giving yourself permission for, for <laughs> doing certain things. And I think, uh, you know, for many years my work was based around research that I was doing in China and East Asia. So the colors that came to the fore because of the history of, of that ceramic material were blues and whites. That's the history of porcelain. That's the history of export wear to Europe and, and America. Um, but just stepping back and deciding to not use that and give yourself a whole new palette of colors and letting them come to really uh, bright kind of poppy colors was very freeing. It makes me laugh uh, internally that it, it took 10 years to allow myself to do that, but that's just the way artistic yeah. processes go sometimes. Yeah. I. I think a lot of artists kind of, they have their favorite colors or the colors that they think they know or yes. understand yes. how they work. And then it's always a little bit scary, but exciting kind of coming out of that. And that's been this, trying to like layer color and and think about the, the colors that we uh, engage with as, as their items as well. You know, you've got your reds and your yellows and when you're putting them together, you're always like, I don't want this to look like McDonald's. Um, <laughs> because so many of these colors kind of connect in our mind too. And you know, you don't want to make holiday references with reds and greens, but you're trying to find the shades of them that can be um, in proximity to each other and not just uh, give one kind of feeling to the viewer. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a fun challenge. And, and sometimes it works out perfectly. Um, sometimes I think it works out well, like the items that are, are here, and other times there are items that are in the graveyard that, mm -hmm. that you know, they're not going to see uh, the gallery because they're just not working in that same way. Okay, so we're going to come back around this corner, and we have these three. I will try to scoop back enough to see them all together. Yeah, these were the, obviously the hardest to kind of put together um, because it was, from the beginning, it was known that um, I wanted them to work together and really flow, uh, you know, hopefully left to right, but then also be able to be read, uh, you know, from right to left. And I think the most challenging part is to be interesting individually. And that's, that's kind of the part that, it's funny because you know you're working on all of them and you don't want all the action in the center panel 
but you also want each panel to be enjoyable and seem uh, relatable uh, in effect to the others in the series. Yeah, I have, I've actually been thinking a lot about how we read imagery, kind of like how we reread in general from that left to right. And if it can be read another way or anything. So it's interesting that you kind of bring that up. Yeah. I, you know, I had a, a, a teacher when I was in university and his kind of like uh, stock question was like, what happens if you turn it upside down? And it, it, it was, you know, it was enjoyable. But after a while, you're just like, okay, he's going to you know, ask like what happens if you turn it upside down. And now that I'm teaching, I'm constantly doing things like that. I was like, you think of it as this way. I think of certain pieces, mm -hmm. parts of my pieces as the front, but what happens when we do look at them 360 degrees around or 360 yeah. degrees up and down, it certainly uh, changes our thoughts of them, even as the maker. Um, when you're making something, you sort of think that you're in charge of it, but there is a <laughs> conversation. And in the collages, that conversation is between the different items. Um, and I think in the, the sculptures, it's between the different forms and the different colors. Yeah, definitely. We'll come to this one. We were here in the gallery last week with a group of students. Oh, um, I was just going to ask Miller about self, that. <laughs> uh, which is, uh, for anyone who doesn't know uh, who's on the stream, it's a, it's a middle school in, in the Akron area that is uh, focused specifically on the visual arts, the performing arts. Um, there's another art, the theater arts maybe is the last yeah. one. I, I'm not so sure about that, and please please uh, accept my apologies for misquoting <laughs> it, but the students decided to tell me which animal every piece <laughs> looked like, and uh, the students told me this one looked like an alpaca, and the joke was, I had always thought it looked like a llama, but I don't know if I could tell the two apart, even if they were side by side. So it was funny that, you know, the greatest part about kids is, is the no filter. They will just tell you, I like this, I don't like this, this is what it looks like. And they, they just said, this looks like an alpaca. And I was thinking, like, that's what I kind of think it looks like, too. So it was fun when there was a mashup between what yeah. they were seeing and even sort of the liminal thoughts I have. It's nothing like an alpaca. I mean, it's like Picasso's alpaca, <laughs> but it's still uh, very much got a reference of that, you know, kind of compact body and longer neck. And again, the notion of uh, laying on more weights and more weights and more weights. So mm -hmm. I guess I could have accepted giraffe from them as well, but I like <laughs> that they hit alpaca. So, so when I heard that story, I started looking at all these some of the sculptures have these almost little stands mm -hmm. and they're almost like little paws. And then the sculptures that are maybe more solid in their base, which we'll move to next, almost have more of a landscape feel yeah. to me. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, speaking of that, we'll move over here. <laughs> this is our ultimate landscape. <laughs> right. So this piece, piece is um quite a bit lower what did um what do you think about kind of putting it on these different levels this one i, I really uh wanted to work so much color into it that if it was in that sort of eye space it would be hard to deal with <laughs> so you know putting something lower uh, immediately we all feel like a little bit more of a command of how we can look at it so this is very much like this notion of clouds and mountains, and obviously there's the rainbow decoration on it. Um, but I wanted to drop it down so that people, I guess, psychologically felt like that they could understand it and not uh, find it intimidating. Yeah, and it's almost like you can come on top of it, so it's not like an overwhelming landscape. Yeah, you're the mountain landscape. climber. Yeah. yeah. Get the label here. Okay. There's been a lot of uh, fun feedback from this one as well. I think everybody just can recognize um, these kind of chomping teeth toys. It, it's something <laughs> that, again, is in like the shared dialogue uh, that people have of like silly toys, but there's a push pull in here between their size 
and then say like the size of the recognizable objects, which are the airplanes or like the scuba diver. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something kind of surreal about them where mm -hmm. they are actually kind of threatening because of how much bigger they are than the, the things that were, oh, that's clearly this, this is clearly an airplane, this is clearly a scuba diver. So you have these ominous kind of like uh, monsters, which is mm -hmm. fun. And Everyone I, likes to be scared. <laughs> I just noticed that the planes are upside down, right? I think like, the I think the way that planes happen is whoever oh. was uh, taking the original photograph is from below. Oh, okay. So you're reading the belly of the okay. plane um, in almost like a flyover motion. It kind of, it's cool that it can read kind of both ways and... Yeah. And you still recognize it, you, you know, because of that sort of iconic wing shape and the iconic tail shape, you're very much aware of, oh, this is an airplane. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So another thing I have to ask about is the tiger kind of pops up a lot. <laughs> and he's always kind of just lurking in the back a little bit or coming in from the side. Can you maybe talk about like, where did you find the tiger and um I, i'm just enamored with animals uh in in a in all forms uh, I, I have a lot of cats in my own life but like the tiger became a symbol of uh just kind of something that is is there and i feel like we think of tigers as dangerous but they really are just like big fuzzy things and <laughs> you know hopefully they want to be friendly uh, this, this piece is very much like my Akron Ode kind of piece. I found the, the large Bee Vendum um, image and wanted to kind of uh, pull together imagery that was very much uh, in, of, or like about Akron. So the Goodyear Blimp, the Quaker Oatmeal. Um, while I know Michelin is not the tire company that was necessarily here, B. Bendham is such a recognizable yeah. uh, figure and so, uh, well, both enjoyable for his sort of wonkiness, but also tied to the tire industry with all that kind of tire shape on him. So this is like very much the, the ode to the idea of what this show was going to be about, uh, but trying to, again, capture it in a very... Uh, sketched out picture plane. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and we'll come to, I think, our last piece. So if anyone viewing has any questions, now would be a really good time to type them in while we talk about this piece. Right here. Uh, the goal of this piece, again, and, and thinking about, like, what would be the front, um, is wanting to make sure that it had... Uh, a narrative to sort of give away as the the viewer was walking around it so i had been working on these barriers which were very much like a, a reminiscent thing of having to mask up um and i wanted them to sort of have one presentation uh when the viewer first saw it but to reveal something new as you go around so you know here and again what i sort of consider the front you get a little hint of uh this hard bright uh you know red curve and then as you come around it, it definitely reveals itself again to be one of these weights one of these rings but it's such a sort of lush color that uh you know you view it as a really enjoyable thing whether or not it's representing something heavy or something really kind of pulling uh the rest of the uh item down and i think the way that these sit on the, the little ball feet, uh, you can kind of feel that, uh, that dragging down motion, particularly in this one. Yeah, this is definitely one that I was really intrigued by the placement of it on the pedestal in the space. Okay, once again, anyone watching, if you have any questions, I'm going to see if i can check nope that's just a right one um let's see what other questions might i have so if this is kind of your first time really showing these collages and the ceramic work together where do you see it maybe going from here <laughs> or have you even thought that far yet it's funny i was i was afraid this was the <laughs> question that, that came up i don't actually know i've been working uh, on a series of techniques where i can photograph um parts of the collages 
and then superimpose them onto the sides of, of objects. But so far, each time I've tried it, I don't like how literal it feels. Um, yeah. it, it's kind of like I don't want that um, fixed uh, imagery on the ceramic work. So uh, I'm still working with how it's going to be. I have a couple of tests that I've done where I've put some of the imagery onto tiles and I've sort of just jam the tile into uh, oh. the three-dimensional work. So it's both there and not there, but this is an evolving process. And, oh, definitely. and I mean, for me, the exciting part is to see it here and really take the time to consider it. And, and then of course, consider that question, which hopefully that's part of the next, you know, yeah. amount of time in, the, in my own studio is finding an answer to how they do work together because that, that sort of image object uh, push pull principle is, is something that, uh, you know, I feel like ceramics people have been working with all the time. You don't want everything just kind of like sacked onto uh, the surface of what you're doing, but then there's this notion of, well, how do you create another novel way to deal with it? And I don't yeah. know yet. Like, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and then what was your kind of experience or did you learn anything with talking to the people of Akron, ex talking about story collecting? Um, cause you've been here a few years now. This is, this is my sixth year here. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not native. I, I grew up on the East coast. I, uh, I moved to, to the Midwest here, uh, for work and there's been this, uh, kind of joy in learning about the really rich history of Akron. I, I taught a class a few years ago, which uh, challenged college students to learn about the history of Akron. So I had some of that under my belt, and that was why I wanted to kind of uh, work with the community to see what their experiences were. Because history is one thing that like, you know, we read it, you, you hear about it, um, but everybody is going to engage that reality slightly differently. Um, for some people, all that history is going to be positive. For some people, it's going to be more neutral. So to get people's stories and, and have uh, people come and say, oh, well, this is an Akron experience that I had. I've certainly had my amazing Akron experiences. I've certainly had my less amazing ones. But you need that kind of uh, roller coaster to make the fabric of a community interesting. So I learned a lot about just kind of experiences people had, both positive and neutral and, and otherwise and I, I think it was great and it would be a fun project to go back to after a certain amount of time and see uh, new people who've come to the community and what their experience with yeah. it is. And is anything maybe more personal or based off your own narratives in the city? Uh, I tried to actually keep myself out of it in okay. some ways. Like this is a, a rare moment as an artist like because we're often our own zeitgeist for everything that we do. I wanted the information to be coming from without this time rather than coming from within. So I try to, obviously I, it's my work, so I can't not have myself in it, but I wanted a lot of the uh, narrative and language to be coming from outside of me. And then of course I, I have to take responsibility for all the choices of how colors were laid together and, and these objects were constructed and these images were constructed. But I think the fun part is, is the dialogue is between me, my practice and the community. So I try Definitely. to keep myself out of it as yeah. much as that's possible. But it, it, everything is done through your yeah. hand, I, through I your filter. mind. Yeah. You know, the that's, filter. That's the kind of notion of, you know, even when we have a camera, you pop a filter on it and it's, it's in everything, but it's also, just kind of barely there physically. And that's that's how I want it to be. My decisions are represented here. So, you know, all the, the bad choices are mine and all the good <laughs> choices are mine. But I hope that I've been able to kind of like put a light out there of the, the community stories and share things that, you know, were uh, other people's experiences, you know, through my filter. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's a pretty good spot to wrap up. If anyone has any questions um, after the live stream, please feel free to comment um, and I will try to look them up and see what answers I can get. I'm going to switch my camera back around me. Oh, if I can just uh, make oh, sure yeah. to thank uh, Akron Soul Train 
and thank um, the law firm of Brennan, Mann and Diamond for sponsoring the residency. Additionally, I'd like to thank the University of Akron. Uh, it's where I teach, and, and they also uh, were kind enough to sponsor parts of the exhibition as well. So I'd just like to thank everyone who contributed and allowed this to happen, and, and also everyone who's come to see the exhibition. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna come back. So there you go. <laughs> okay, so Drew, thank you so much for leading us through the exhibition here, there, everywhere. And thank you to everyone viewing for joining us. Uh, once again, thank you to Brennan, Mana, and Diamond for sponsoring Drew's residency. And the show will be up through December 3rd. Also on view is Daniel Trzinski's audiovisual installation, Shores of Echo, which is up in the Capsule Gallery. Um, and our gallery hours are Wednesday through Saturday from 11 to 4. You can also catch us this Sunday for Artist Sunday at Summit Art Space from 12 to 5. We will have a booth and you can get some unique gifts by local artists um, for this holiday season. So we hope you uh, support local art this holidays. And thank you all for joining us and we will see you in the next live stream. Bye. Bye everybody. <laughs>